Thank you guys so much for joining us for um, this webinar. We're really excited to, um, I'm really excited to hear Dr. Schlecht. For those of you who don't know, Dr. Schlecht is a senior faculty of history at New St. Andrews College. He is also the director of our Masters of Studies in Classical Christian Studies here at the college. He, all, I believe you teach um, in that program as well. Um, he is a historian, not just in the classroom, but in the fabric of his being, I believe. And he has a, a delightful family with a bevy of kids and grandkids. So I introduce Dr. Schlecht. This will run pretty simply. He's going to give a, a presentation for 35 or so minutes. Please hold your questions till after his presentation and uh, we will dialogue at that point. All right, well, uh, thank you, Grace, um, and welcome to everyone. And again, uh, welcome to many of you who, uh, who I know. It's fun to kind of look at the roster of attendees. Um, so uh, anyone who spent any time with, within the contemporary revival of Christian and classical education has certainly come across Dorothy Sayers. You know, Rome has its Romulus, the Civil Rights Movement has Martin Luther King Jr. The American founding has George Washington. And so the contemporary resurgence of classical Christian education has Dorothy Sayers. Um, I don't think the comparisons are overstated. Uh, Sayers holds quite a central place in the contemporary renewal of interest in the medieval trivium, and uh, which is why it's worth considering the question I'm addressing to you today, which is, did Dorothy Sayers get it wrong? Um, and uh, I trust most of you are here because the webinar was promoted by New St. Andrews College's marketing team and recirculated by ACCS. And it was the marketing team that provided this clickbaity title. I tend not to be a very clickbaity sort of guy, but Dorothy, did Dorothy Sayers get it wrong? <clears throat> Suggest that I'm entering deep into the bowels of controversy and I'm going to say something edgy. Um, well, <laughs> yeah. I'll leave it to you to describe or to see what how edgy I am. Um, so it could be then that uh, some of you are here uh, wondering whether I'm going to work up a mob of educational protesters who want to pull down a big statue in the town square of classical and Christian education. Um, but I think most of you are little bit more level-headed than that, although there might be a few of you who are here to participate in that kind of mob, but uh, I'm going to disappoint you. What I am going to do is show off my PowerPoint skills that I can actually uh, create little symbols like the cross-out thing, uh, which, by the way, is, uh, is very technologically advanced for me. Um, so I'll cut to the chase here. Um, if you want the basic answer to what I really think, I'll just disclose that at the outset. So here's the spoiler. Um, Dorothy Sayers got it part right and she got it part wrong. Um, but I'll also argue that what Sayers got wrong is, well, it's really important to recognize what she got wrong, but what she got wrong is not nearly as important as what she actually did get right. So in these respects, I do think Sayers uh, compares pretty well to Romulus and to George Washington and to Martin Luther King Jr. Um, each of these men, like Dorothy Sayers, have blots on their record, uh, but uh, we can still recognize their accomplishments. Rock, Romulus organized the abduction of Sabine women, but we still remember him uh, as the founder of Rome. Martin Luther King Jr. was unfaithful to his wife. It should have disqualified him from pastoral work, but we remember him for the important work that he did on behalf of civil rights for blacks. Um, George Washington was credibly accused of committing an atrocity back in the French and Indian Wars. But of course, we remember him for his leadership in the Continental Army and his service as first president. Um, so when Dorothy Sayers wrote on education, she presented 
what I'm going to describe is a pretty convoluted idea of the trivium. Yet at the same time, we rightly remember that uh, we do remember Sayers for urging us to reconsider and revive the Western tradition of education. So you all know where I'm headed. Um, before I get to the details of my assessment of Sayers, I want to explain why this matters, though. Um, it should, this conversation should matter to us. Dorothy Sayers matters because she provided the key inspiration that launched the contemporary renewal of Christian and classical education. Um, and this renewal is a renewal that I certainly identify with. Many of you, I can see from your names, you're people that I know, and you're part of this movement too. Um, we need to reckon with Dorothy Sayers because of the recent history of Christian and classical education and the recent history compels us to do so. Now, our movement, the movement that I am a part of, is a grassroots ph phenomenon that really was born out of the culture wars of the 60s, well, actually 1970s, 80s, and 90s more properly. Um, those decades witnessed a generation of ardent Christians who became concerned about mainstream culture and particularly uh, education within mainstream culture. And generally speaking, these Christians who were concerned fell out uh, according to two different broad strategies. Uh, some, some sought to reform uh, American education through political and legal channels, and so uh, they waged battles before school boards, and they advocated for curriculum that represented tr traditional values, and so they wanted creationism taught alongside evolution in science classes. They wanted abstinence to receive its due in health and sex education classes. Uh, they wanted to reassert the centrality of Western civilization and of American history, particularly the ideals of American founding, over against uh, multiculturalism that was vogue in those times, in those decades. Um, and again, these were debates that raged in local school boards and other policy-making bodies, some of them national. Um, but there were other Christians who pursued a different strategy at the same time. Um, these were activists who engaged in a different way. Rather, they stepped aside altogether from public schools and built up countercultural uh, institutions. Um, and in education, again, these were the homeschoolers and the founders of private Christian schools. And this is where our movement fits in with this latter group. Uh, it was these Christian parents who walked away from mainstream public education and they wanted to do something different. And different means what? What does that look like? And so they cast about for inspiration and ideas. And there was a group in North Idaho who happened upon Dorothy Sayers' 1947 address, The Lost Tools of Learning. Um, and they decided to take Sayers' program as a model for their school. Now, for four decades, Dorothy Sayers' address, The Tools of Learning, was a little known flight of fancy about reforming education. It was pretty obscure. Yet there was this local school out in the hinterlands of Idaho that adopted it. And uh, that was a pretty isolated development until 1994. Um, and in 1994, one of this Idaho school's founders, Doug Wilson, published the book Recovering the Lost Tools of Learning. And in it, um, he actually reprints Dorothy Sayers' address, um, and, uh, and this too might have been rather obscure, as many of the other books in this series were, that was published by Crossway Books, but, uh, but this book became something of a sensation. Uh, it had a pretty remarkable reception, and its remarkable ex uh, reception shows the level of dissatisfaction of Christian parents around the country, and also their dissatisfaction with other available offerings and sources of inspiration. Um, a lot of Christians were looking for a model of education that was distinctively Christian, certainly. But more than that, they wanted an education that was intellectually rigorous and one that was historically rooted, that could trace its roots back to a time before education had become an arena for social experimentation, like a laboratory of modern child development fads. And uh, so Dorothy Sayers represented an answer. 
And so it was the publication of this book in 1994 when the ad adjective classical became attached to an education that was associated with the traditional liberal, seven liberal arts, and particular, particularly the arts of the trivium. Before this book was circulated, you'll not find the word classical used in quite that way. You don't even find the word classical used by Dorothy Sayers herself. So then it was just five years, uh, five years later when uh, Susan Wise Bauer came out with this book, The Well-Trained Mind, A Guide to Classical Education at Home. And this book also promoted Dorothy Sayers' vision for education, uh, but now applying her vision not to institutional schools, brick and mortar schools like Wilson had, but to homeschooling. Uh, Susan Wise Bauer introduced Dorothy Sayers to a whole new audience. And not only that, and, and just as significantly, she perpetuated Doug Wilson's innovation when she too attached the adjective classical to Dorothy Sayers' education. So this was the landscape uh, as it stood about 20 years ago. Whatever education was that carried the adjective classical, it was pretty much what Dorothy Sayers had espoused back in 1947. <laughs> and so classical education also became, a, it was growing into a movement and it had the hallmarks of movement with, uh, um, and of course the boosterism enters in when a movement mentality strikes. And so this adjective classical was used to promote all manner of educational wares. There's classical pedagogy, classical curriculum, uh, some, you know, there were self-appointed experts who would describe one, one Latin program as being more classical than another Latin program. And so you've got classical writing programs, classical flashcards. Uh, you'd run across classical worksheets, classical worksheets for studying the Great Depression or for studying Watership Down or Charlotte's Web. Um, and you can tell then that it's a movement when the adjective classical becomes a slogan. Uh, for boosterism, marketing, and uh, kind of a rally cry for organization. Um, and uh, this, of course, uh, introduces some confusion and muddiness into the conversation, as it invariably will. Um, but uh, let's go back to what Dorothy Sayers actually said. This is what brings Dorothy Sayers onto the landscape. Um, and in her address, The Lost Tools of Learning, she articulates her purpose as this. If we are to produce a society of educated people fitted to preserve their intellectual freedom amid, amid the complex pressures of our modern society, we must turn back the wheel of progress some four or 500 years to the point at which education began to lose sight of its true object towards the end of the Middle Ages. And this, I would argue, is Sayers' real insight. This is the most valuable thing that Sayers presents to us. And indeed, it's at the center and core of what she wants to present. She says, let's go back in time. And so what she proceeds to do is put forward what she characterized as a rather outlandish proposal that we recover the medieval trivium, that is grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric. And in order to cobble together and recover the trivium, Sayers went to a medieval graveyard and exhumed various elements of long decayed curriculum and pedagogy. She pulled them out of the ground and stitched them together a little bit like Dr. Frankenstein had done with actual human body parts as he, that he had exhumed from graveyards. Stay, Sayers stitched together these dead body parts and out of it she made a creature that was in certain respects hideous. A creature that no medieval would have recognized as the trivium that uh, they understood. The trivium that emerges from Sayers' mad scientist laboratory invites those of us who are morbidly curious to ask the question, is Sayers creature an educated an education that we find in the Middle Ages, or is Sayers' creature a modern monster? So 
I count myself among those who claim that Sayer's Trivium does resemble historical education, but I also have to concede that Sayer's Trivium is certainly a product of a creative genius, a mad science genius. Her genius uh, was kind of like Frankenstein. The creature that Sayers brought to life includes some rather grotesque qualities, but she did stitch it together from actual body parts of long buried education. So, and I, in, in, in comparing Sayers to a Frankenstein and to her notion of the trivium as Frankenstein's creature, um, I want my point in saying this is to note that Sayers really did play fast and loose with historical terminology and with historical categories that are tied to the trivium. Um, and what she actually produced, on the other hand, was a nice concise formulation that did capture key themes, key ideas, and key concepts uh, from the great Christian tradition of liberal education. She took these themes and ideas and drew upon some aspects of the historical trivium, but then she stitched them together with themes and ideas about pedagogy, and that's not quite how the trivium was historically presented. So uh, in order to get some traction into this uh, quick synopsis of Sayers, if you are here in this webinar, I'm sure you've read Dorothy Sayers. What Dorothy Sayers does is she presents the arts of the medieval trivium, grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric. These are the linguistic arts of the trivium. And she associates them with stages of development of the cognitive and uh, affectational development of children. Um, she describes three stages of development, the pole parrot stage, the pert stage and the poetic stage. The pole parrot stage is a stage where students love to memorize and echo back and chant. Uh, the pert stage is when uh, young people like to argue, like to push back, they're very contentious. And the poetic stage is that stage where young people like to find their place in the world. Uh, they begin to appreciate rather than just combat. Um, so this is the stitch together uh, she takes these curricular elements of grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric and stitches it together with the stages that a child moves through. Um, now, uh, we do see uh, early on some people started questioning whether or not Sayers is actually representing history well. And we see it in this book by Robert Littlejohn and Charles Evans, uh, their book, Wisdom and Eloquence. Um, something I commend to you as a great uh, history of this conversation is uh, is the journal Classis uh, that goes back um, uh, that goes back in I'm trying to read the date on my screen there um, but it came out shortly at, shortly after Little John and Evans book uh, and this issue of Classis is is uh, a conversation around wisdom and eloquence. And uh, part of the conversation hinges on the historicity of Dorothy Sayers. And I think what you'll find is actually everyone, Doug Wilson and Little John and Evans, first of all, are pretty congenial and agreeable. They're not pugilistic. And, uh, and moreover, all sides concede that Dorothy Sayers was playing fast and loose with her categories. Well, more recently, we see, uh, things cropping up like this from the Searcy website. Dorothy Sayers was wrong, the trivium and child development. Um, Martin Cothran, who's a good friend of mine from Memoria Press, uh, writes this article, Classic, classical education is more than method, the secondary place of Dorothy Sayers trivium, uh, which argues that we should cast Sayers aside. Uh, the Society for Classical Learning um, uh, had a session that was actually by a fr good friend of mine, Andrew Selby, uh, presented this presentation, Dorothy Sayers was wrong about the art of grammar. We have, I, I point these out to show that there are voices in the conversation that are saying, Dorothy Sayers got it wrong. Dorothy Sayers got it wrong. I think these are important voices uh, in the conversation and helpful voices in the conversation. How do we move the conversation forward? How do we navigate 
uh, this discussion. And uh, what I want to propose to you is uh, a way of thinking about this whole conversation, a way of thinking about this debate that I think can help us to navigate it. Um, and uh, in order to introduce the uh, buoys of navigation here, I want to offer these four ways of representing knowledge, um, representing or organizing knowledge, knowledge, you know, what can be known. Uh, there's a vast array of the stuff that you can know. How do we organize the stuff that you can know? And there are four ways, maybe there's more than these four, but uh, at least these four I think are going to give us some traction for the purpose of our conversation. First of all, um, there's encyclopedic organization. So if you're going to organize knowledge into an encyclopedia or in an encyclopedic manner, you're going to catalog all that can be known. So you might catalog the history of Rome and the history of France. And this is, of course, within the domain of history. And but that's national history. But we can also talk about regional history, like the history of the American West or the history of the Near East, which is not national, but it's regional or geographically or organized. Or we could organize history by race and ethnicity, like the history of the Jews or the history of the Irish or black history. Um, so there's, but however you arrange it, you're trying to talk about knowledge and in its full reach and some of the relationships perhaps. So some, uh, we might have genus species relationships, biology and chemistry and physics or branches of natural science. Encyclopedic organization presents what can be known in some sort of organized fashion, but you'll notice this encyclopedic organization does not sequence how it, how it comes to become known. Uh, so encyclopedic organization is not the same thing as curricular organization as we're going to see. All right. Um, now, in describing encyclopedic organization, I should note this, that most presentations of the liberal arts in the Middle Ages are laid out in encyclopedic form. This includes most presentations of the linguistic arts of the trivium, the grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric, of the mathematical arts, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music, or harmony. Um, a little bit later, the humanities. What are the humanities? Well, the humanities are the four disciplines, grammar, rhetoric, uh, and uh, poetry, moral philosophy, and history. Those are the, those five disciplines of the humanities versus the seven liberal arts. Now, different medieval writers organized or presented kind of the org chart of their encyclopedic encyclopedia in different ways. Um, but oftentimes they were presenting grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric in the sense of encyclopedia, in the, in the sense of encyclopedia. Um, the Romans, Cicero and Quintilian, actually placed grammar and logic within the domain of rhetoric. Those were species within the wider domain of rhetoric. John of Salisbury, a medieval from the uh, 12th century, placed grammar and rhetoric within the domain of logic. You see this in his Metalogicon. So you've got logic as a genus, and within logic you have grammar and dialectic, uh, which is interesting. So the, uh, the taxonomy varies depending on which person you're talking about, but they're all encyclopedic presentations of knowledge. And the historic trivium is almost always cast in an encyclopedic way. What is the scope of this domain of knowledge and how does it stand in relationship to other domains of knowledge? That is how his, um, most historical sources present uh, the trivium. But there's also historical development. That's another way of organizing knowledge. Um, and this is basically presenting knowledge uh, organized by a history lesson. So you're going to talk about calculus developing later than arithmetic. Calculus is developed in the early modern period. You didn't have calculus, at least as it would come to be known. You didn't have calculus in the ancient world. So this is a presentation of knowledge that's organized in its historical derivation. Of course, aeronautics and nuclear physics and cardiology are not going to be things that you will introduce in a historic presentation when you're talking about the Middle Ages, okay? Uh, 
um, they were developed later, domains of knowledge that were developed later. Um, people have been talking about the past, have been reflecting upon the past ever since the Garden of Eden, but it was Herodotus who separated a poetic representation of the past from what we now call a historical representation of the past. So while reflection on the past is kind of a human thing, but history as a discipline, at least in the Western tradition, uh, had, originates with Herodotus. So we can talk about knowledge in the way that knowledge came to be discovered and represented historically. Hugh of St. Victor, uh, in his Didascalicon, um, argues that logic was the latest of the arts to be developed. So if Hugh of St. Victor is presenting a history of knowledge, and that's the way he's going to organize knowledge, then the latest art that he would talk about would have been logic. Um, so that's, that's a different way of organizing knowledge. So encyclopedic organization, historical development. Um, then we also have ways of sequencing knowledge in order to explain it to another person, to explain it to another person. And this is going to have a bearing certainly on education. Um, and so this gets to my third and fourth bullet point as ways of representing knowledge. Um, basically, what do you talk about first and what do you talk about second and what do you talk about third? Okay, um, that's what I mean by sequencing. And, um, and you can conceive of sequencing based upon the inherent properties of what it is you're explaining. And you can also conceive of sequencing based upon the inherent qualities of the audience to whom you are explaining it. Okay, so with regard to that third bullet point there, sequencing based upon the inherent properties of what you're explaining. So you're going to talk about multiplication, yes, but addition will come first. You can't really, you're not going to introduce multiplication without introducing addition prior to it. And just the nature of the material itself suggests that. Um, and, uh, and this is true no matter how mature the student is. Notice this is sort of like regardless of audience. So if, if uh, you had a 40 or 50 year old who was unfamiliar with mathematics, you would certainly still introduce addition prior to introducing multiplication, right? And that's inherent in the, in the material. Um, some medievals, some medievals discuss some of the liberal arts in this way. Um, let me give you an example, and, and it's usually in reference to grammar. Um, John of Salisbury says this, grammar is the cradle of all philosophy and in a manner of speaking, the first nurse of the whole study of letters. It takes all of us as tender babes, newly born from nature's bosom. It nurses us in our infancy and guides our every forward step in philosophy. That's from uh, the medieval writer John of Salisbury from his work Metalogicon. But here we see that uh, an example or an illustration of grammar as something that is prerequisite to rhetoric, uh, prerequisite to actually other studies as well. To uh, um, I think John of Salisbury would say grammar is prerequisite to astronomy because astronomy has vocabulary and syntax, and you need to understand vocabulary and syntax. Indeed, you need to understand words, and you need to understand letters before you can even communicate other things. So therefore, the inherent nature of the material gives grammar sort of uh, a priority, priority in the sense not of more importance, but in the sense of sequencing in relation to other things that might roll out when you're communicating it. All right, but then finally, we have sequencing, you know, in the order of communication or presentation that bears in mind the inherent qualities of the audience to whom you're explaining something. So uh, this takes into account the frame of the person that you're communicating with. And when we're talking about students, we do know that students actually mature. They mature physically. It's a biological fact. They go through from prepubescent pre to postpubescent. This, uh, this is recognized in scripture. The apostle says, when I, I was a child, I thought as a child, but then I put away childish things and I moved on. There's something about a childishness. Child, children are described as playing 
in a way that's unique and peculiar to children in the scriptures. And this is also just very evident, plainly evident in the natural world. Anyone who has sense observes that children develop. Um, and, and it's also true that we organize or sequence the knowledge that we will explain or elucidate to students, bearing in mind their development. Um, and we find this in the tradition. So we know of a child's fascination with familiar stories, for example, like, uh, you know, my, my grandchildren, when they're four years old, they will ask to have the same story read to them again and again and again. But you won't have a 13 year old ask for the same old thing to be read to them again and again and again. Um, imagine teaching Jane Austen to an 11 year old versus Jane Austen to a 17 year old. A, an 11 year old can understand Jane Austen in the sense of following the characters and the action that the characters go through, but it takes somebody to go through puberty to understand Jane Austen in a very different way, right? Um, Jane Austen for a 17 year old and their capacity to grasp and appreciate it is different than the capacity of an 11 year old, just because 11 year old hasn't been through puberty. Um, when a teacher explains a concept in order to move a student from the point of not knowing something to the point of knowing it, from the point of ignorance to the point of knowledge, um, the teacher needs to be aware that an eight-year-old will be stimulated in different ways and by different things than a 17-year-old would be. And the domain of what a 17-year-old, of course, is much wider than the, the domain of what an eight-year-old is familiar with. So when we sequence material, another factor or consideration is sequencing based upon the inherent qualities of the audience to whom you're explaining it. Now, all four of these ways of representing knowledge are important in education, and education will traffic, in different facets of education will traffic to a degree in all four of them. Any curriculum, any curriculum is going to echo encyclopedic organization, historical development, sequencing based on the inherent properties of what you're explaining and sequencing based upon the inherent qualities of the audience to whom you're explaining it. As to this last point, as to this last point, this is what Sayers is highlighting when she describes Paul Parrott, Pert, and Poetic. Uh, she is contemplating a sequence based upon the inherent qualities of the person to whom you are communicating. And so she theorizes about those stages. Now, there are some of, some of Sayers' detractors will say that Sayers is, uh, Sayers is making a move from modern psychology. And so she's in, importing something that is alien to the history of education by, simp by virtue of the simple fact that she sequenced based on the inherent qualities of the audience to whom you're explaining it. But what I wanna tell you is that the history of education, including the Western Christian tradition of education and indeed the pagan tradition that preceded it, did contemplate sequencing material based upon the inherent qualities of the audience to whom you're explaining it. And if you read a rhetoric text from Cicero and especially from Quintilian, you're gonna see that uh, the presentation of material must factor or take into account the audience and indeed the stages of the audience that you're looking at. Aristotle himself in his rhetoric highlights this when he, in, in Aristotle's rhetoric book two, where we differentiate between the appetites and the interests of the young versus the old. Of course, when we present material, when a teacher communicates material to the students, the teacher needs to bear in mind this kind of sequencing. Now, I do believe that modern educational psychology founded as it is upon naturalistic assumptions, founded as, a, as it is upon evolutionary assumptions about humanity, denying that man is, the, is made in the image of God, denying that man is a soul, but uh, a reductionist materialistic presentation of psychology um, is problematic in education today. But, um, 
through the tradition, we do, that doesn't mean that we should never look at the child and we should never look at the stages of development that a child goes through, okay? It doesn't mean that we are captured by the categories of modernity if we pay attention to a sequencing based on the inherent qualities of the audience to whom you're explaining it. This, I would suggest, is something that is in the tradition and which Sayers does pick up on. She puts her, uh, she's trying to capture it in an elegant way with her uh, pole parrot pert and poetic. And this is what she stitches together with grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric. And that becomes a Frankenstein. Um, she's, she's taking a presentation of the trivium that in history is presented in terms of encyclopedia, and she's wedding it with something that is present in the history of education, but that wedding or that marriage is a Frankenstein stitch, <laughs> okay? So child development is in the history of education. Encyclopedia, of course, is in the history of education. Um, the stitching of them together, Sayers is simply trying to represent what education looks like, and if we take what she is doing in her essay, The Lost Tools of Learning, as kind of a manifesto to sort of represent all of that in one bailiwick, then for a one-off piece, I think she actually did quite well. She actually did quite well. But if you start probing and exploring the history of grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric, you're going to realize that she plays around with the terminology and she plays around with the categories that are rather alien to the historic presentation of those categories. So, did Dorothy Sayers get it wrong? Yes. Did Dorothy Sayers get it right? right? Yes, absolutely. But I hope you can see uh, the manner in which she gets it right, in which she gets it wrong. And, uh, and classical educators who want to take Dorothy Sayers' central insight, which is that we should go back, that we should draw insights from those who have come before us in education. That important insight is fundamental to something that Sayers gave us that I think we should follow. And so, uh, as you've probably seen in the advertising, this webinar is actually a foretaste, a little nutshell of a course that I'll be teaching here at New St. Andrews, the history of classical and Christian education. And this course, is actually going to walk through works like Augustine's on Christian teaching. It's going to work through Martianus Capella's A Marriage of Philology and Mercury. It's going to work through Cassiodorus's Institutes of Divine and Human Learning. We will read Hugh of St. Victor's Didas Gallicon and a host of other works. Um, and that will teach us to go back, to go back just like Sayers asked us to. And so I do invite you to join me uh, for that class uh, that's going to be offered by New St. Andrews College. And with that, I do want to get into a conversation with you. So I look forward to uh, hearing your questions. Uh, thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Schlecht. Um, I'm sure if we were all in a room, everybody would be clapping. But <laughs> um, yeah, if uh, you all have questions about um, Dr. Sleck's presentation about classical um, education in general, about this class he's talking about, please um, shoot your question over to me privately, and then I will field the questions and um, throw them right back at Dr. Schlecht. We have a few people telling me in the chat box that they're clapping. Uh, <laughs> well, you all are, are very kind. This is, uh, I, I really wish we could all be in the same room together. And I also wish, especially knowing many of you who are present here, I would love to be in the same room with you and to hear a whole lot more from you and what you have to say about these topics. Many of you I know have read some of this material and I would love to engage with you about your thoughts. Either a quiet group or everyone's thinking about Every, the questions. Ev oh, here, they thinking, here they come. Mulling, mulling these things over. Yes. Yes. 
Um, so when you look at uh, grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric, again, they are presented as pieces within en an encyclopedia, and you see different writers representing the encyclopedia differently. Um, the taxonomy of knowledge um, is presented with different organization by different writers. But nonetheless, when grammar, dialectic, and, and rhetoric are contemplated, they are doing encyclopedia, um, if I can call, <laughs> if I can use that part of speech that way. They're usually doing encyclopedia. When Sayers turns it into pedagogical sequencing, she's making a move that's not really resonant with the historical presentation. Awesome. So I'm going to um, sort of lump a few questions together um, to because uh, there it seems like a common theme. But given modern psychology and our modern culture, the culture that Dorothy Sayers was writing for is just not what we're looking at right now. Um, do you think her three stages of development are accurate and still apply, or do they um, or do they need to be adjusted in some way? Yeah, I um, I like the way Sayers presents the stages of development, and uh, to the audience of educators she would have been writing to, one of the things I appreciate about it is she is making an appeal to common sense. She's making an appeal to common sense rather than to the scientific presentation of child development as it was available in the vocabulary of 1947. And the audience of educators that she was writing to, I think, would have noticed that she is making a departure from this, the science of modern psychology um, when she just says, hey, look at kids and your experience. And that method of paying attention to kids, just look at kids and what they're like, you see that call throughout the tradition. Um, you see that call throughout the, it certainly predates the advent of modern psychology and the modern categories of psychology. I think we see it in scripture, just like look at people, they change, right? That's all Sayers is doing, nothing that's any more sophisticated than simply that. Um, so you don't need to get a psychology degree to follow Sayers' three stages. Um, and I think that uh, it's also a call to just simply learn from your own experience as a collection of teachers. Uh, I think Sayers is just saying, watch kids, pay attention to kids, learn their propensities and their, and their aspirations and their attitudes, and understand that when you're presenting material to them. I think Sayers is saying nothing more than that. And I, and I would commend that. Awesome. We have a few people, I think, um, in our group, we've got a pretty diverse, um, a diverse group as far as what their, what their education um, situation looks like. How would you recommend for somebody who is working in a school that is, or maybe they're homeschooled and they've never done classical, this is maybe their, their introduction to classical education, how would you move forward? Or if you're a teacher at a school and um, no one else knows what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, how do you how do you move forward with with anything um, in uh, in the span of a quick webinar like this? That's a that's a million dollar question, and I and I respect the questions too much to pretend that I can give you a magic bullet answer in the kind of format that we're dealing with here. Um, that is a very important question, and those of you who find yourselves in the situation, you know, may God bless you in that situation. And and the best recommendation that I can give you, um, or the first step, would be to network with people, uh, to network with other people, um, and to start somewhere. Um, I would suggest that uh, the most crippling thing for changing or bringing about change is to be overwhelmed by how vast the change needs to be. And when you're overwhelmed, you don't know where to start. 
start with what you do know and surround yourself with people who have been there before you so that you can continually confer with them. So start with whatever you know. Um, and actually doesn't even matter, I think, which, which step is the first one, provided that it's the one that you can see. <laughs> which, um, and then surround yourself with other people who have come before you, who can give you advice that you can bounce ideas off of. Go to a conference, network with other people, strike up conversations. And that's the, that's the first step. That's the first step. And once you become part of a community, um, then you'll have the benefit of some of the insights of working together and drawing from the lessons that they've learned. So become part of the community. Awesome. I have a couple uh, people asking questions about different groups within the classical Christian education movement. There are Charlotte Mason, CR, uh, the Searcy Institute, the ACCS crowd. Um, do you have any advice as to um, as to what train to jump onto, or um, it, it sounds yeah? <laughs> That's right. The, um, I think uh, I would I would connect this with my previous uh, with my previous question. I would also add to the group that you listed. So you listed Circe, ACCS, and Society for Classical Learning. To that, I would also add classical conversations um, that are more or less kind of organized groups. And uh, what I would do is I would look around in your own community, um, in your own church, in your, in your neighborhood for like-minded people. And I would ask first, are any of them kind of attached to one of these communities? Um, if my first step is to join a community, and I also said it doesn't matter, it matters most importantly that you take the step more than which one, um, then whoever you're around and whatever conversations they're in, join the conversation. And then wherever you break in, I do encourage you to branch out and don't get, don't be insular. Um, so if you're an ACCS person, I think you should branch out and and interface with the Searcy people. And if you're a Searcy person, you should branch out and interact with the SCL people. Um, and I think that that's very healthy for all of us um, to do. So that's uh, in terms of a modus operandi, here we go. I'm not going to, especially in a forum like this, I'm not going to uh, play political partisan and say, this organization is the organization. And I think you all know that I would step on some toes if I were to do that. And it's not my disposition to do that anyway. Awesome. We have uh, actually a couple people have asked this question. Could you um, find the poly parrot stage? Okay, yes. Um, first of all, I commend to you to read Dorothy Sayers' essay, um, uh, The Lost Tools of Learning, and if you do a Google search, surely it will come up in a variety of places. Um, and so the question is simply to elaborate on something that Dorothy Sayers says in her essay. And so this is the first of three stages of learning that a child goes through. The pull parrot is the first of the three stages. And so it's described in terms of the characteristics or qualities that a child exhibits. And this is a child that is heavily imitative and loves to imitate and parrot back, okay? So these are children who will sing the ABC song, um, who will sing the song because they were taught to sing the song and they love the sound of themselves and especially themselves joining in a community of singing the song. Um, these are, I, I mentioned the quality also of, uh, of memory. Um, I think again of my uh, four-year-old, my, my grandchildren at four years old uh, do have this capacity to, to memorize something sort of just for its, own, <laughs> for its own sake. And you play that memory game where you turn over the cards um, my four-year-old grandchildren and I are probably on an even playing field. It's remarkable what they, what they can memorize. Um, whereas for an older person, I think we, I mean, we all memorize things, right? But 
the for the older person, we memorize things better the more embedded it is um, in our our sense of God, the universe, and everything. <laughs> the more deeply embedded it is within the whole framework of God, the universe, and everything, we memorize better. Um, and a younger person doesn't need as much embedding in the whole swath of God, the universe, and everything in order to memorize something. Anyway, so that's the Paul Parrot stage in a nutshell elaboration. Is, can I say nutshell elaboration? Or is that <laughs> go? Awesome. Um, so we have a few people, you, you've described classical education here, um, and a few people have asked for your definition of classical education in a, in a, in a elaborated nutshell, let's say. In an elaborated nutshell. Yeah, I would say, uh, again, given my prefatory remark that the adjective classical when it applies to education, I think it, it's incredibly elastic in usage, <laughs> okay? Um, in actual usage, it's, uh, and I also believe that appropriate definitions, appropriate diction is descriptive of actual usage, right? Um, and uh, the word classical um, inhabits a movement that is rather amoebic. Um, and so I think the accurate definition to classical really is rather amoebic. <laughs> so with that as, a, as that as a preface, you're all, you are asking for my nutshell. And my nutshell is basically this. Um, classical education, I would say, is an education that is informed by and deeply inspired by and patterned after the Western tradition of education or the tradition of education as, as it was presented in Western Christendom. And so I, I would define it historically, which uh, circles back to what I identified as Sayer's greatest insight, which is to go back. <laughs> so it's the class, it's the education which goes back and gives some due authority and due respect to what's come before us. That's what classical education is. And just to follow up on that, a lot of times there are people who have maybe teal teleological definitions of what classical education is, um, applied wisdom or um, learning the tools to be effective. How does that, do you think they're saying something different? Um, I think that those are, those notions are picking up on, on different and important elements of the tradition. And one of the things I should also say about the tradition is uh, I'm rather agnostic on whether it's rightly described as the tradition or the traditions. Um, the story of education over history is actually, it's more like the story of many voices in a common conversation. Uh, there are actually competing ideas and, and arguments, disagreements uh, within the tradition, if I can say that, <laughs> okay? And so anyone who presents classical education in terms of a consensus of particular ideas, I think will, will fail in measuring that up against history. <laughs> because when you find people whose voices are present in the tradition, oftentimes you'll find parts of their voice that are arguing against the other voice in the tradition, right? So to, to, think about, to think about it in terms of a common set of shared ideas, um, which idea was shared? <laughs> which idea was the shared one? Um, no, what you have are shared conversation topics with different voices on those topics. That's what you see is shared in the community of classical education over time. And I think that's what history presents to us. Awesome. And going back to, um, I'm sorry, I'm not going to get to everyone's question. This is a very um, sharp and interactive group. But going back to something that was mentioned um, earlier. So I uh, had a few questions, people asking, how do, how do we apply this in a new situation? Uh, but then there were also a few people asking, how do we 
um, a, how do we make changes or edits in a, in a school where everything is set, like, oh, this is the classical way, um, right. and there's nothing we can change about it, um, and this is the curriculum we use. Do you have anything to add to right. that? Yeah, and uh, that's, a, that's a great question, and you're probably going to see me uh, reverting back to familiar themes that I've already articulated with just the new application to this very, this very good question. Um, and I think that, first of all, um, the realities of today, I can give you, a, here's, a, here's a good concrete illustration, if I can offer an illustration that might be uh, an entry point into the question. Um, so today, I can assign my students Herodotus and they all have their own individual personal copies of Herodotus. I think that's a good thing. That fact is utterly alien. That's alien to medieval schools, uh, whether they're monastic schools or cathedral schools. It's alien to Roman education where everyone's got their own personal copy of this text. Um, yet, I would argue that it's a good thing that we give uh, personal copies of, uh, of Herodotus, let's say, to our students. That is a modern innovation. And it's a modern innovation that's born of the technological advantage of mechanical print and materials and that sort of thing. So what we need to do is we need to be in conversation with and give due deference to those who came before us. But I would argue that, I mean, I want all my students to have a copy of the Iliad or a copy of Herodotus or whatever, right? So. Um, so there's a degree to which we all need to play fast and loose with the historical record. And that's why I think um, we have to be a little sympathetic rather than more critical with Dorothy Sayers. When Dorothy Sayers is playing fast and loose with history, um, if someone says, oh no, I'm going to be true to history rather than this Frankenstein thing like what Sayers did, we are all constructing Frankensteins. If we're taking the past seriously, but if we're taking it seriously with children today, we are all doing Frankensteins, right? <laughs> we're all doing that. So the question is a, a how-to question. How to, you know, we can't, we don't want to become reenactors of the past. And I don't, um, and so that would be an error. And I do, when I see some people speak, it sounds, they come across to me as though they want a reenactment, like those who suit up in uh, Confederate uniforms and reenact Pickett's Charge or something. I, none of us believes that a reenactor of Pickett's Charge, I mean, we don't want to send those people over into Iraq and Desert Storm, right? <laughs> um, so uh, we want to give deference to the tradition and to learn from it and then to appropriate it for our own time. That's a Frankenstein project. And the process is to join the conversation. And the conversation needs to be uh, made up of people who are reading in the tradition and sharing their ideas and imp implement, implementing them, and then be in conversation with people at other schools and what's working, what's not. And, oh, here's a new nugget I learned from Hugh of St. Victor. Maybe I can adapt that today. Join a conversation be part of a community, and that's coming back to my old refrain, and there we are. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Schlecht. I know we're um, a couple minutes over here, but if you, thank you for joining us um, at this webinar. If you're interested in um, experiencing more of Dr. Schlecht on the classical, the history of classical oh, Christianity. Experiencing uh, more of Dr. Schlecht, oh my. Um, and if you want some of your unanswered questions, yeah, that's an attractive pitch, not warding them off. <laughs> uh, feel free to check out our websites or email, um, or if you want to talk to a real person, you can email me or my colleague, um, Jacob, at these email addresses. All right. Thank you all very much. And may God bless you all in the good work that so many of you are doing. And may God bless the children that you're working with.